we just kind of like lose that. Like you were talking about, you know, much, much decades earlier in Hong Kong movies. Why do people look like they're exchanging the longest, most elaborate secret handshake with each other? That goes back to a martial idea, like a very chi- distinctly Chinese idea of like listening and sticking. Right. That is supposed to be an approximation of you kind of like feeling out your opponent and listening to your opponent and looking for opening or trying to learn and trying to adapt the idea of what Bruce Lee said of like being water or whatever. That's what that is supposed to approximate. But over time, it becomes like more and more formal and elaborate. At some point, I think now, 50 years later, is it's just completely disconnected from uh, its original intention. Today on Action Talks, I'm pleased to introduce Pete Lee. Pete is a director, writer, and food photographer. His work has been at Sundance, South by Southwest, and he received a James Beard Award. And Pete's also a friend of mine. We go way back. He produced Death Grip, and he co-directed Rope It Up 1 and 2 with me. So, uh, And most recently, he worked on uh, Second Unit on Boots Riley's I'm a Virgo. But I think most importantly, Pete is a great mind when it comes to Hong Kong cinema And uh, though we disagree on everything, uh, we come from the same place and we love all the same movies. So, Pete, I'm excited to talk to you today and disagree with you yet again on everything. Uh, And thanks for coming. (laughs) Yeah, let's relitigate some fights. Let's do it. Uh, Uh, Shanghai Affair, yay or nay? Type Uh, it in the comments, everybody. I mean, I think for the sake of... For the sake of disagreement, I'll try and steel man that whole movie at some point. Um, <laughs> tough, tough as it's going to be. When did your love of action cinema, Hong Kong action cinema, begin, and how? I don't. I mean, I don't know. I mean, I always loved it as a as a kid. Uh, I grew up in Taiwan, like during the heydays of Hong Kong cinema. Um, my parents were very protective. They were you know, uh, educated and, and, and also they're very uh, religious. And in the eighties, there's this, you know, big movement to, uh, it's probably a good thing to protect your kids from, uh, you know, I guess like worldly entertainment and that kind of thing. Uh, And somehow I guess every parent uh, had a different uh, uh, definition of what they consider like safe and unsafe. But my parents, Anything out of Hong Kong was just uh, questionable, except for Jackie Chan, which we got to see like twice a year. But then Jackie Chan started going into like the rated R category uh, uh, um, towards later. So like for a while, I just had nothing. But it was all like anyone ever talked about. I remember like one uh, uh, winter winter break, which we had like over Chinese New Year. And it was so exciting. My family, we went to see Project A2 in the theater and also uh, Anna Jones and the Last Crusade. I also think Who Framed Roger Rabbit. That was a great, you know, you didn't go to movies like once a year. We went three times that winter break and it was awesome. And I couldn't wait to talk about it with my friends. And I came back as I think I was in third grade and every kid was just talking about how awesome the God of Gambler was. And there was like little girls I've seen God a gambler three times. And I had no idea what they're talking about. And I think so much of it just came from me, like making up sequences in my head, like trying to imagine what they must be saying. And then when I got a little older, I got to like sneak out. Hey, I'm going to get some noodles down the block and I'll just finish uh, just crazy, crazy boom B movies that I'm still kind of like looking for. But that was kind of my, I guess like uh, uh, well, my curiosity or whatever. And I don't know, like in college, uh, that was when I like moved into a big, big city and there were some like underground video stores. You know, that was when that culture was really thriving. You know, you, uh, you, model you, were not, you weren't in Taiwan at that point, though, right? I wasn't in Taiwan at that point. And also like a lot of my friends after a certain point kind of graduated from Hong Kong movies, you know, and by the time I was into Hong Kong movies, you know, all of them were watching, you know, Matrix and that kind of thing in the Bourne movies. So, um, yeah, so I think that persisted, but I do think like the, the birth of it was just 
my parents like really, really just like putting their whole bodies in front of a TV and kind of not allowing me, you know, you, you can only take in so much MacGyver is what I'm saying. Did you, um, I mean, were there censorship laws in effect in Taiwan when you were a kid? Very young. Uh, there was nominally a martial law, even though it um, more or less existed in uh, like very, very selectively or, or, or in, uh, in name only. And uh, Chiang Kai-shek's son uh when he died and i was i was really really young i think that was effectively lifted but yeah i think a lot of times it wasn't censorship so much as like distributors uh if they could if by you know removing uh, a topless scene a movie can go from r to pg-13 or even pg or things like that Hmm. then they would and i think uh the rating system in taiwan um i guess much like what um, America has turned into, like has a much higher tolerance for like violence than uh, the other stuff, than like nudity or other uh, topics and whatever. So something like God a Gambler was like a kid's movie. And, you know, that that movie had everything. So, yeah, you get kind of you kind of see something similar in Japan where they have a very probably even a more relaxed stance on violence than they do in America regarding kids. We do draw this dividing line yeah Uh, but even in japan right like um i don't know watch some like the more recent animated adaptation i think just because they want to market to a much wider audience or whatever so they figure out ways you know not maybe not sanitize it completely or whatever but they figure out ways to especially in animation there's so many ways to play up or play down the level of violence just by the color and the angle and the that kind of stuff. So I've been noticing that a bit as as well. Um, yeah, I don't know. I guess it's inevitable. You can't. You yeah. You got to get that international money. So when you would watch Jackie Chan movies, for example, um, what were you looking at with Jackie? Was it the gags? Was it the comedy? Was it his just the action scenes? I think it was the fantasy of of being Jackie Chan, right? And 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 it's a very different fantasy from let's say like Jet Li or Donnie who just comes in and overpowers or Chan Fat who doesn't even seem like he knows how to fight but somehow he gets out of it the winner. He gets out of it looking really cool. And the the fantasy of Jackie Chan is just like, "Oh, I can duck under that thing and make a fool out of these international terrorists and that kind of stuff." You know, uh there was like a, a sense of wit and uh, I don't know. I mean, we can talk about this now. We can talk about this later, but I always feel like Jackie Chan is probably the f- first action star since Buster Keaton to constantly play down his capability. Like everybody else, he, including Jet Li and Donnie have to be on top of their A game and still use a ton of, you know, camera tricks and visual effects and also doubles uh, to make themselves look and feel invincible and while jackie chan seems to be like endlessly capable uh but in every movie he seems to like pick a different limb to tie behind just so you can relate to him and that just like supreme confidence as well just knowing that like oh my character just not gonna know any martial art in this movie and we're just gonna jump around and uh and we're gonna defeat Ken Loeb somehow, you know, by the end of it. So, um, do, you, do you think that his shooting style being very locked off and wide, which is kind of unique in the Hong Kong style, do you think that that is his attempt to kind of show that vulnerability? I wonder. Uh, yeah, because Samo's uh, camera work may, you can, you can say like Samo's camera work feels more subjective. Like, these are things that you will see or these are things that you should notice if you know how to fight. And so that gives you that fantasy of, like, knowing, of, like, being a super, a a, a, a master and being a tough guy. All the way back to things like the victim or whatever, when the camera is actually still very, very far off, but he would zoom in on the thing that he wants to to pay attention to uh, and that kind of thing. 
And um, and Jackie just never really did that. I mean, not since he went into the modern era or whatever. Or the way he uses Zoom is uh, for comical reasons. Uh, you know, the way that like how Ashby used Zoom or something like that. Um, so, yeah, I think it's too... It, it's for some kind of objectivity. And I also think it's also because he can, right? Uh, it's probably just, it probably costs more money to shoot it his way. If, uh, if we're fighting and, 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 and I mess up, like, and we're really short on time, like we couldn't just like punch in, go in for a pickup, go in for a reaction shot or whatever. Um, so I think some of it is probably just pride is, is, also him like linking himself uh, uh like trying to elevate himself above everybody else and also linking himself to right the buster keaton and harold lloyds of the world do you think that that was an extension of the shooting style that had preceded him or was there no. something different about it i mean yes in that like cameras back then just moved a lot less right um our buddy Stu Mashwitz was giving me a lesson on the history of cameras and uh how hard it was to move cameras all the way until the 70s um and uh just when they'd start developing like crazy em emotions and, and 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 that kind of thing and so the period in with which like filmmakers had the freedom to like really like whip their camera around really wasn't very long it was like 10 years before jackie started decided to like lock everything off so it didn't seem like but to contradict myself i also felt like i mean that period also felt like forever in many ways like from king who to bruce lee to post bruce lee like uh uh, uh where you have you know, Troy Yen doing Usha stuff on one side and have Lokala on that side. And then a couple of years later, you have, you know, Chen Seo Tong and, and like all of Jackie's classmates all coming out, right? Yong Ping and his bros. Uh, that was all within the span of <laughs> 10 years of like three iPhones. Uh, but those felt like huge leaps. So, um, yeah, but it didn't seem like that much uh, uh of a continuity i mean what jackie was doing wasn't super groundbreaking he wasn't like Choi hark where he was like you know going to lucas you know uh, finding puppeteers who did you know the yoda stuff or whatever but he also wasn't like chin shil tong who was like in his own very limited way trying to figure out a ton of like optical tricks like on his own by himself essentially he seemed more in the middle and he seemed a lot yeah, he seemed to like have a formula that he it wasn't even like he's repeating it, but he was trying to perfect it. It's almost like he um maybe his innovation was you know, I mean you could almost look at Jackie's even looking at Dragon Lord. There's I don't think there's a single dolly shot in that movie. Uh -huh. And you you know, you but like the three years, four years before that in Shabra is like the 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 golden era of dolly zooms and <laughs> like 16 people on a camera or maybe three i have no idea these were all martial artists on the camera as well in a sense and so jackie you could argue is like maybe saying like no let's let's let the action speak for itself but then at the same time with that comes this sort of necessity to innovate how the action even lives in the scene and perhaps yeah. the two are just kind of like those are just the same thing to him i think one of the uh trickiest things when you shoot wide that we rarely rarely talk about is just like if the choreography is not up not up to snuff like the audience can lose that like sense of danger or 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 or, or, or lose that intensity or that sense of suspense like really really quickly because like even if the audience doesn't know it they see a wide shot they see two people doing shapes at each other uh like there is some part of us who will think that like well why doesn't that person just walk away um and i also think like uh, to skip ahead like 50 years to watch what is happening now a lot of times uh i see a lot of these like kind of like military thrillers where they're doing two things at once one is um 
everybody knows oh shaky hand shaky cam is out and 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 and, and born uh, uh 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 ultimatum stuff is out so we want cool locked off white shots so we can show uh you know chris hensworth's you know training and, and and whatever but at the same time these people were doing like close quarter tactical military stuff or you know military stuff um and that kind of choreography almost doesn't work if you go too wide because you're doing you're trying to trap each other but there's so much room um it's like the same reason that bruce lee realized uh wing chun doesn't work in the ring because man jack Wong can just back up forever so yeah like those kind of the considerations and jackie has to figure out ways to justify to corner himself in these really really wide frames which seems like a given now and seems very repeatable now but <laughs> must be maddening back then probably and you you also i mean i remember reading something about keaton and how or maybe i heard this on gilbert godfrey's podcast uh where he was a uh you know he's a performer second and an engineer first and mm -hmm. he would engineer his sets so that all of his gags could work because well yeah. you couldn't move the camera this just wasn't an option yeah. Uh, so how do you set up a camera to tell a story and then set up these gags like you're mentioning? And I'm I'm sure that Jackie. It's he's engineering locations, right? Like all of that is. Yeah, sure. There are times where he goes to a location and sits and just like becomes, you know, the action will become part of that location. But that takes days for him to get there, because otherwise, like you said, it's going to feel forced. Why not just run away? Yeah, and he does. And he and that's also like the thing that pe people don't really talk about. Like people misunderstand Jackie Chan's acrobatics, right? Uh, he's not he's not flipping just to flip. Uh, he always like corners himself where like the only thing that he could do in Rumble in the Bronx is to row off of that weird arch thing that he seemed to have like kept from Pol <laughs> Police Story too, and took it to Vancouver with him. Somehow like that guy came back, yeah, where he like. Uh, uh, wrote, wrote down it and wrote off of something and does like a a a a, a the brand yeah. Yeah. Yeah, yeah yeah uh yeah. onto that was one of most like impressive things <laughs> I've seen him do especially a man in his forties and they he just kind of did it um but yeah he always makes it I mean you you talk a bit about um shapes right like. The reason martial art movies look good is like people making these shapes to occupy a space. And there's something just really satisfying about shapes in space. And that really felt like what Jackie was doing. They're like, he has his Canva and he shows you all the negative space in the frame. And don't worry, he's going to, you know, and somehow like that satisfy like that part of our like inner OCD. Mm -hmm. uh, and some people just don't understand that. I, 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 yeah, I think he it's it's very innate. I mean, I do wonder like how much of it he really like thought about. Yeah, or how much of that is just sort of intuition from a performer yeah. being on a stage, right? It's like as, as a stage, you have natural empty space that is is it has to be filled up. It's funny you yeah. just said yeah. that. Yeah, don't worry, it's going to be filled up. It's like, yeah, as the audience, when you have empty space, it's this sort of intention that you have like well there better be something there soon yeah <laughs> yeah exactly and and um it's 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 almost paradoxical to creating a sense of danger um uh, especially with hand-to-hand -hand combat because like you don't have guns you don't have arrows that can reach across the stage so like jack jen has to move at really just like a crazy pace and, and whatever. And that also happens with just uh, martial art choreography in general. You're really chasing each other with chains, you know, with leopard and that kind of thing to really like impossibly try to close this like really, really wide gap. Uh, and, and it's funny because like a lot of martial art movies are these paradoxes where uh, you have something that's like really small and violent, but uh, they like their poetry. They like to set in a bamboo forest on a waterfall or if you're in Hong Kong, you know, some kind of cliff overlooking like the little parts of Hong Kong that still hasn't been developed <laughs> to death uh, and that kind of thing. 
Um, and yeah, I don't know. But I remember when Drew, when you and Alvin were shooting that knife scene in Death Grip. Uh, that's very, very like, those are super close, like very like detailed oriented fight and a lot of movement, you know, it's game of inches and you're really getting close in there to show that, you know, if Alvin just was just a couple inches to the left or something would have gotten cut. It happened uh, quite a bit. <laughs> but that's one thing about Drew was that was his what? That was his first martial art movie. Um, Drew Daniels, by the way, who went on to shoot just a ton of crazy, you know, Euphoria, The Idol, Red Rocket, you name it. This this kid shot it. Uh, he just knew how to frame it in the way that feels like your back's against the wall, even though we're shooting at this really, really big, empty, like boomy room. OK, I want to jump to Samo because you compare someone like Samo with a very montage style of filmmaking where you still get the sense of space but it comes in as different kinds of pieces of information. You know, I can watch Pedicab Driver a lot of the time just to try and like, try and figure out that room at the end with Billy Chow. <laughs> I'm always trying to figure out like, like I wish, like I'm trying to design a top shot for that scene because you <laughs> never quite see the, the room. Yeah. Like, yeah. Do you think that Samo's sense of space, is, it, is, it, is that a martial artist's sense of space? <laughs> Yeah, like that idea of a uh, creating, regardless of where you are, you're creating a ring, you're creating a dojo, you're creating, uh, right? Like that was something that actually I don't quite love about modern, uh, a lot a lot of modern movie is like they feel previs in that way. Uh, I remember um, Freddie Wong, uh, you know, famous YouTuber and nephew of Corey Yoon, uh, who uh, once talked about how action, how choreography should feel like it can only happen in this space at this time. Um, and a lot of times you watch movies where, you know, you have action scenes in an art museum, in a coliseum, in a something, and you're just like, oh, there's all these interesting elements. But when it comes to them shooting at each other or fighting each other, suddenly, as soon as action happens, you can feel like, oh, there's just randomly like a 10 by 10 space or whatever um so um samo has a little bit of that but he's just again he's just good at using hands and feet to create that sense of claustrophobia so that was like not a um a coincidence that he he got billy chow in there because billy chow can trap you with his feet that's an inter- um, it's a really interesting point you mentioned that because Samo never takes any time to kind of establish like, oh, look at all the stuff that could break in here. It's like mm-hmm. the, all that stuff is introduced when it happens or just yeah. before it happens as a setup. Yeah. And it's more about like how many bodies are in there. Right. That's like what he uses to create that. Yeah, I guess uh, claustrophobia is like a huge part of, I think, any fighting. Um, if you're a boxer, you're constantly figuring out how to dis- distance manage and that kind of thing. And it seems like we've lost a little bit, quite a bit of that in modern choreography. It seems like um, a lot of uh, choreographers, and I hate to say it, these are our friends. These are really, really talented people. And if you talk to them, they'll tell you that it's a producer, it's a director that wants something yes. else. Um, but uh, for whatever reason, you know, a lot of them, I think because it came from like the martial arts kind of tricking background. So a lot of times what they've been encouraged to do their whole life is to take up as much space, yell as much, really, really big action. Every fight is opposed. That's kind of like the modern way in solving uh, the space problem that I think we all have to solve as filmmakers. Um, and uh but it seemed like the way samo did it back in the days is to like you said like to use a lot of editing to make it feel like regardless how big the room is there's this superhuman a uh, 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 billy chow who's probably your height but they make him feel you know like kareem abdul jabbar and they make his arms and legs feel like, you know, uh, Dalism, is that his name from Street Fighter? Where it's just coming at you and at you. And 
he just knows like the perfect angle for each of his kicks and each of his techniques. So they feel like really, really long. Um, and also like who else can front kick like Billy Chow, you know, like all the front kicks in modern choreography has been replaced by the Sparta kick, the Spartan kick. Uh, but Billy Chow's front kick just feels like, it feels like a death sentence. Um, yeah, because there's, there, yeah, there's something about that, that guy. That's <laughs> <Like>, why <laughs> Samo used him in everything. Um, but I mean, he can do that with anybody. Like Billy Chow's a Billy Chow, but like he turned a Benny the Jet into a Billy Chow. And Benny is, uh, you know, like a bull or whatever, but he can make like Benny's punches and whatever, just feel like it's coming, it's coming, and it's coming. So that's a great yeah. uh that's a great transition point to to kind of go back to Jackie Chan, right? Because you have Jackie versus Urquidez in a Samo Hung movie. Um <laughs> now I've always I've always thought that I'm always trying to read the relationship between Samo and Jackie and in, in their works together. Jackie didn't really bring Samo onto many, I think the only thing he brought him onto is Project A. After that, it was Samuel bringing Jackie. And whenever Samuel brings Jackie, that's a fight. Like, that's a different <laughs> fight. Um, what's your read on a film like Wheels on Meals as a Jackie Chan movie, as a Samuel Hung movie? And how it's shot, you know, because like, to me, it's like this weird kind of mesh of the two. What's your read on that fight? Let's, uh, 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 I'm going to project because uh, again, um, there's a lot of stuff that there is uh, literature for Samo loves to talk or whatever. But for this, I'm not going to do any bibliography. I'm just going to guess. I'm going to project. Um, I think there's some type of uh, like healthy jealousy that fueled that uh, interaction or in which like Samo feels like he can do all the stuff that Jackie could do. Um but he wants Jack, somebody wants Jackie to do it. Like there is an envy. Like you just, you just know that when Jackie does it, people watch, people watch in a different way. And Samo could put himself in all kinds of, like he's, they're just, you know, there's just levels to it. Like Jackie's a star, 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 star. Like, and that must have been so baffling um, to Samo, who was better than Jackie since they were kids. And then Samo, like, work with the greatest, like, work with Bruce Lee and whatever. And to see this kid who just, like, came out of nowhere and dom and was doing a lot of things that Samo was doing, but it, like, really clicked. And, yeah, and maybe there's, like, a couple of things that Samo couldn't do. Samo probably couldn't uh, round kick as quickly as 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 Jackie, you know, uh, uh, not that Jackie was like ever that proficient at at his like roundhouse or whatever, but like at least he could do it. Samo, he's like he's like me. He has to lean all the way down just to bring it to head level and bend his knees out a little bit just to reach that target. Uh, and it's just like those little things like that that just you know put them in different categories. It's not those little things. It's also Jackie's like just brilliant in his own way. But Jackie was building so much on things that he and Samuel probably talked about and discover and worked on together. And it must be maddening for Samuel to see Jackie kind of become this international darling who could speak foreign languages, who just, you know, and that kind of thing. And I do think that like, it's, it's weird. Like, it's one thing for me as a director to tell you to do all the things that I fantasize about doing. You're fighting. Uh, uh, Dennis is like, yeah, what have you? And, and you can just do. I remember this one time um, we're doing Rope a Dope 2 and we were you or you guys were like so gone. We can talk about that later. And then right before uh, rolling, you turned to me, you're like, any last notes? And I was like, yeah, just do what you just did, but sharper. And then you just said no shit like with so much resentment and the entire set just starts laughing and that felt like in many ways like i mean that's very different because like samo could do probably 95 percent of what jackie was doing but i felt like at that level samo was asking jackie like to do everything that i would have done but yeah better 
And I think there's probably resentment on the other side too. Like Jackie trying to outgrow that style. Um, but Samuel kept putting him like back into that box. And it's probably very, very punishing. And um my guess too, if I were to jump in, uh, my guess yeah. is that Jackie was not going to back down from that, and Samo knew that. Yeah, there's a sense of like competition. I mean, that's why they broke yeah. up at the end. Um, but uh, Dick Way had a story, I one of those uh, uh, Dragon Dynasty <laughs> DVD extras. He had a story about, uh, I, I don't know what they're filming, but the two lots, the two studios are shooting next to each other. Um, Jackie was doing his thing and Samo was doing his thing. And then one night, you know, Samo and his bros, they're doing, they're fighting and they're fighting deep into the night and Jackie's already wrapped and he's, you know, he was tired and he poked his head in and goes, you guys are still fighting this way. And then just left. And Digway is like, I'll never forget like that disdain that Jackie had. So, um, yeah, it's, it's weird. Uh, there's this, yeah, there's this healthy i guess healthy uh competition i'm sure it doesn't feel healthy all the time i'm sure it's probably hard to be on that set a lot of politics to navigate um but uh, in hindsight right they they were better when they were together yeah and like a heart of the dragon a couple years later too with dick way um you know, it's another fight where you 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 get the impression that jackie is like being pushed in a different way than he normally is just being directed by this guy who's playing his mentally disabled brother i wonder mm -hmm. what that i wonder if that was like an even like bigger <laughs> knock from <laughs> sam was like all right not only are you going to starve but i'm going to be mentally disabled and i'm going to step behind the camera and direct you <laughs> <laughs> yeah like trying to steal the show yeah i don't know you, yeah. you can tell they watch raymond or you're tom cruise i'm dustin hoffman you know uh speaking of dolly speaking of like sense of claustrophobia like I think that was the peak of Samo on his Dolly game. Um, there was a lot of like interesting Dolly from early on. You know, we're talking about like the victim and and and, and magnificent butcher and that kind of thing, where they were doing really really difficult stuff. You know, the the AC or somebody had to like snap zoom in, snap zoom out at different parts, and you really just have to like land on those hands and those shapes and. That kind of thing, but they always still felt very uh, two dimensional. Like there's this choreography, and the camera is outside of it. And um, Heart of the Dragon was like when Sam will really figure out. Like it really felt like the camera was in the middle of action, and not just because like they're doing these crazy kind of you know Michael Bay esque uh, 360s and that kind of thing to kind of like mark out of Jackie's targets and whatever and just by like how telephoto those lenses are like they must be really really far and the positioning had to be like really precise um but it's cool it all just works it all really just feels like everybody's like closing in and samo also knows that like jackie is at his best when he like plays desperate and he hits that note like less and less towards the uh, the latter half of, of of his career or whatever but like when he's like backed up against the wall when he's like corner and this thing literally has like multiple times as in like backed up against the wall including and it's almost like a metaphorical uh a uh, 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 move where he flips off of that wall to kind of give himself some space and to take out uh dig way but that seemed like you know, uh, 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 a metaphor is not the right word, but sure. it, I mean, it's it encapsulated the spirit of that fight. Yeah. So at the same time as that, Jackie's doing police story. I think it's around the same time. And he also has his philosophy about how to be in the fight in that mall fight at the end. Yeah. Um, and you said something interesting one time that know and you, know, you just see other elements of these than i than i do where you were you're talking about how he's always trying to get out of the fight um how did you read 
the difference in style between you know Jackie's style and Samo's style because you're not police story is not a comedic fight right it's it's for all intents and purposes that's pretty much a Samo fight just done in a Jackie way what do you think drives that difference the big difference is the camera still felt very neutral right it didn't feel like Jackie was he you, he has his own camera tricks and editing tricks but it didn't feel like you weren't in on it like it's 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 much less like inviting like he's not like a magician that lets you know that he's doing you know like a pen and teller who's explaining to you what they're doing to you you know there's a sense of showmanship in with like samuel's um directing um that just jackie was just completely disinterested in recently i've been getting i've been hearing more and more of this conversation as like horror movies have made a comeback and became much more of like a director's vehicle in the last like five, six years. You see a lot more like comedy directors who use the same technique to do horror. Uh, I think uh, uh, Bill Hader for Barry is like the prime example, just like the deadpanness of in, 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 in the deadpan with which you tell a joke is actually perfect for like the deadpan of which you like depict some kind of horror. And I think that was what Jackie did with Police Story is like, if I were to just describe that fight to you, you're like, that sounds hilarious. He used a mannequin, he used a, a coat rack uh, and that kind of thing. But like, it's really cruel. It's like really, really brutal. And, but it's that same, um, yeah, like, I think that's a difference between like having a sense of humor and being funny, right? Like a lot of great horror movies have a sense of humor, but it I think having a sense of humor in um many ways almost just means like you're able to see things from a different way. You're able to change your perspective uh midway or see something that's unexpected and but you don't have to actually like follow through and be funny. You don't have to follow through and like deliver that punchline uh so that seemed to be uh what jackie was doing with like police story or whatever just like what if i were to take out all the jokes in my in my fights and they almost seemed like a way for him to prove that because obviously earlier in that movie um there was a baby there was a, a the bridget lynn fight or whatever they're using all the same stuff it just Add, he just gives you that one extra shot or that extra pause for laughter for comic timing or whatever, and he just took it out in, uh, um, in the end. Yeah, and it almost yeah, seemed he, like him proven. He wanted to prove that he can do modern and he can do a thriller and he can do a cop movie. Kind of interesting what you said about sense of humor versus being funny, um, because actually we did that with Death the... Grip. Yeah, yeah. Well, I mean, that was my whole philosophy was like, if we just combine horror, I mean, it's the same vehicle. You yeah. Just, you know, you you set something up and then then you deliver on like a different kind of logic in that. I think they like maybe when with horror, you know, you build people up and as like the, you know, as the magician behind the scenes, you kind of know what people are expecting and you deliver against that. This way it produces a scare. But then if you if you give it in just this like a slight twist also against expectation it produces laughter and maybe you know to to early uh you know to, to early showman on the street like the sense of humor is almost like you have a sense of the humors of people where like it's just like <laughs> medical sense where it's like i kind of know yeah. where their blood is going i you uh -huh. know you're almost <laughs> acting like you're almost like predicting how their fluids work right that's what a humor would be in that sense yeah 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 um <laughs> and being funny yeah, is just like one of the humors <laughs> i remember reading uh, uh uh this like medieval uh murder mystery called name of a rose about like 13th century catholic monks yeah and when they describe people full of humor they meant like they're diseased and yeah like plagued <laughs> um yeah i think uh and you definitely see that like because in, in, in both cases you're building tension right you're you're building tension there's an expectation and then you pay it off and you either pay it off by subverting the tension or pay it off by 
almost like confirming their worst fear or something like that. Um, and yeah, sorry, we're getting a little far from, I mean, police story, if you haven't seen it, I mean, like, hello, but also it's, yeah, it's, it's not a horror movie, I promise, but it, there, there are like individual gags in there to like, when I watched it in eighth grade, that just seemed like not, yeah, like it, 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 it was gripping in, 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 in a way. And I think we're talking about the objectivity of Jackie Chan's like camera work. I think some of that almost hurt uh, uh, the stunts, but like, you know, like that big one at the end, uh, Feng Hock Ong does the back tiger onto, uh, um, you know, just like the edges of the escalator. Um, I feel like there are probably other ways to... Sh- shoot that or capture it or whatever um but jackie wanted like the most objective like most documentary style but i feel like there are probably other angles <laughs> so you could see it as being even like more painful mm. uh and especially as the exclamation point to that entire fight scene it was just like one little thing i guess the exclamation point is his uh slide like I guess what he's saying in hindsight, now that I think about it, is that like what what he's putting these bad guys through is almost inconstant. Like he's not thinking about it. He's not purposely torturing them or whatever. He's just like trying to get them to stop hurting his witness and his girlfriend. It's kind of um it is interesting then to look at his shooting style going from then, uh, where you know, Samo's style, he would always follow the stuntman down. Um Maybe you can correct my memory, but my understanding is that as Jackie went, his style became more Japanese where he wouldn't follow the stunt guy down. He would remain at the center and he would choreograph it so that the impact, the impact was choreographed for that angle and the fall was choreographed for that angle. Now, if he falls in shot, that's, that's great. Congratulations. And miracles, you see the guy go off, you know, the, and, and whatnot, like miracles, they, he seems to still be doing that. But then later on, it seems to be much more about him. I don't really remember seeing many stunt guys wreck later on in Jackie's films. Man, that's a really good point. Cause uh, that's really funny, man. You're hurting my feelings. Cause I had this great theory about how Jackie was selfless and gives stunt guys a spotlight and you're right those are samo movies the, well okay those, you can think of the it most too famous as... <laughs> example are the 540 to the 540 to the ground in dragons forever right that's like as a stuntman that's one of well okay project a2 uh johnny chang doubling for uh chan wai ming falling through the vase or off of a vase i guess that's what you're saying is the camera didn't well, no, I mean, I'm saying that that was earlier on, but later, mm. you know, Rumble and later on, you're not really showcasing these guys so much anymore. Now, I could be totally wrong about this, but it seemed no, like the I focus think... was much more like, let's just stay on Jackie. And if the stuntman falls in that shot, great, we'll stick with that. But otherwise, like, if that guy gets pushed off that way, we're not cutting to him over here, like, showing what wow. happens. Yeah, I think you're right. I think some of it i wonder had to do with um just his team aging right like he stuck with his team a bit more than the other stunt guys samo started going to china to look for like you know ushu students like way 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 earlier than everybody else and samo was coming back telling people like y'all are sleeping on the you know like they they felt they outdid us but jackie didn't I mean, Jackie started recruiting our buddies and whatever, like much later. But yeah, you're right. I mean, my 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 guess is that the what that does shooting that I call it the Toei style shooting. uh, Yeah. Where it's like the the, the, the head, you know, samurai is at the center. And if you're doing a wreck, like wreck, wreck on frame or wreck on this thing and then fall off camera or because the the camera will not go with you because that kind of like you lose frame. Yeah. And the audience wants to be watching Jackie. And maybe as he became more aware of that, he kind of broke from the Samo approach. I'm thinking a, a bit more in terms of like just utility, like utilitarian perspective, because like difference also between Samo and Jackie is like Jackie started working with a lot more foreign stunt guys. So and a lot of times 
to get away with like uh, to to get away with doubling or whatever. Cameron just couldn't like move down to Rocky Lie in the blackface. Uh, <laughs> and like how many how many black faces did they put that guy in? You know, and like and and also Jackie doesn't like it when a stunt guy covers himself up or whatever. So I guess the compromise is. But yeah, like he started working with a bit, a, a, a lot more stars, uh, even if they're not known to us. Like he likes to cast stars and, and, and um, yeah, I think Drunken Master 2 is probably the last time when you see those kind of like Project 8 style crashes. But you, but they're in the frame with Jackie. Well, no, like uh, the ladder, I, I remember the big ladder gag. I guess that's not Jackie. Or also, um, Jackie's bamboo hidden a guy uh, in the. In but that's the not foot. Jackie. That's that's La Galarung's shooting style. At the end, in the end scene, oh. any, any stunt involving anybody else, he's he's in the frame as well. Yeah, I guess my interpretation of that was like they were those four stunt guys was actually like twelve dudes. It seemed. Like it was Mars and it was not Mars and it was they were just trading hats with each other. Yeah, that is uh, the name of those guys. There's Mars, not Mars. Uh, <laughs> <laughs> yeah. There's Mars, not Mars. Mars, Tybo, not Tybo. Yeah. Um, it felt like he kept those guys so much longer than all the other stunt guys did. So, um, yeah, I wonder if that was just the effect of. Even the stunt guys need stunt guys. Mm -hmm. So you can't really showcase those falls the the yeah. same way. Um reminds me, reminded me of uh LeBron James, um, who uh, in his old age loved playing with like older dudes that he trusted, that he had chemistry with rather than athletic freaks or whatever. He, he just I think that might have been also like what Digway was talking about. Um just uh, yeah, his technique changed. Like he didn't care that much about. Uh, in Chinese, they say chun chun dao ro, you know, like fists, like land, like fists pounding the meat, you know, that kind of thing. Like, um, he was much more happier giving you that illusion, while keeping his, you know, technique. Um, actually, I want to go from there. Go ahead. Uh, to so this is word. I think I think we're roughly in like 1998 right now, and this is about <laughs> when we when we met, uh, and we met on the internet, which back yep. then which back then was way cre creepier than it is now. Yeah, uh, because we're out there. yeah yeah. There's that, and and also like, well, what places did people meet on the internet back then? We had this forum. Uh, there was the Project J forum. Um, but we brought, I, you know, we had been watching a lot of the same stuff and we sort of brought all this stuff together. Um, and uh, you you seem to remember that community better than I did, uh, than I do. Um, but what are your recollections on what the kind of, I, I would call it the intellectual climate around Hong <laughs> Kong cinema was online back then? Don't give me all the credit because I think uh, the first the first uh, uh, forum that we all met on was a legendary Project J forum, and it was uh, started by this guy Koichi, who I think was an amateur soccer player. Right, he was like rehabbing and he built this thing. He was the guy that really fostered that like curiosity, and he had pages and just like the rarest of photos of every stunt guy he documented stuff so it really felt like that and that fostered that set the tone for all our conversations and then obviously we were all calling each other gay and that kind of stuff and calling movies gay and whatever so that wasn't him that was us but that was also just the time um the <laughs> Oh, Vlad. Uh, <laughs> Not pointing fingers. <laughs> yeah, he, he just throwing Vlad under the bus. Um, but anyways, uh, yeah, that just, we're all like 16 or 17. <laughs> I don't think there was that much of, uh, 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 of a climate. I think a lot of this came out of little enclaves where like we were the coolest. We we're the ringleader in our little town or on our college campus or whatever. So we wanted to come here and be the ringleader 
of so I, I I do remember there was like a sense of competition. Um and it started out just verbally. There was I mean camera was so limited back then. Uh if you had a high eight, like your parents were rich, you know? Um and also camera men cam or camera persons were so uh, uh limited back then as well. You know, you had these Greek brothers where like uh, uh uh they just had to put the camera somewhere and they fight each other and then cut to a lot of like bruce lee angles of one attacking the camera and the other person yeah because they had no third person to do that um i don't know when exactly it went intellectual like or maybe it well it was it was semi uh okay let's say professional with quoon yeah um, that was pretty professional a lot of us a lot of us looked at quoon as like Almost like, okay, we want to be that, but we'll never be that. <laughs> they have money. Yeah, yeah, yeah. And I think Kuhn, what was interesting was, again, speaking of like setting the tone, even though it was Todd's forum, like, oh, Onassis wasn't on it that much, but his martial knowledge was so deep and he just would not tolerate people speaking gibberish or rubbish and, and, and whatever. And what was interesting about him, too, and he's like one of my biggest influence, I think, just as a person, uh, and, is, is that he, he loves traditional martial arts and he but he like thoroughly knew its limits uh, and he didn't. But he wasn't disappointed in the martial art. He didn't talk down to the martial art because of it. Um, he just understood that, like. Uh, 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 Honga is great, and he he was raised on a bunch of different martial arts, but he really found his uh, um, family with Hongakun. And but like they don't train like they fight. He talks about uh, if you were to fight a fencer, like those guys would kick your ass, even in a street fight. You fight with a wrestler, like he puts you in a leg lock, you can do all kinds of technique on him that's just gonna make him mad and he's gonna try to break your legs sooner, you know, like that kind of thing. Uh, and he just like really set that tone and it was a grown up kind of tone. And I think, uh, you ended up doing that with uh, your uh, stunt people forum is maybe more explicitly because it was a bigger board, so you really you, you had to moderate it, but on top of that you set the topics on things that you're interested in and it was a lot more craft and stunt based it was a lot more interest you're a lot more interested in like details of a choreography rather than like this movie suck this movie's overrated and that kind of stuff that permeates movie talk to this day hmm. uh but you are much more interested in like those little details like how people fall uh and, and 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 the hong kong spin and critiquing people um landing on your back landing on your side are you completely straight when you land and that kind of thing so um i don't know is that your recollection well i i yeah i have a recollection of moderating and putting out <laughs> fires daily and there weren't many fires because i don't know there was a selection mechanism in place just naturally where it's kind of like running the point and click adventure fans unite group on facebook mm -hmm. I, when i when i handed it over to pascal i had ten thousand people mm -hmm. um like there's just a certain like cut of people that just don't really bicker right yeah um of course there's gonna be one or two uh we won't name names but <laughs> on the stump people forum the main the you know you're talking about a bunch of a bunch of dudes who want to just do cool stuff and they want to learn from each other. And I mentioned, I mentioned this in the action essay I did, which was that because we were, because we were doing this Hong Kong style and we were sort of influenced by this, this aesthetic that to me, when I imagine the Hong Kong style, I sort of imagine like two people running at each other and coming <laughs> to the middle and like agreeing on a fight. Right. And whatever, <laughs> whatever looks the best, you kind of agree. Yeah. And it was just like, it's almost like a, like a very prolonged duel. We have to talk about that soon. Like what, why that is what it is. Okay, but keep going. Yeah. Sorry. Yeah. So that 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 attitude that you, like if that's your inspiration, then when you collaborate with other people, you're not really 
interested in showing how you can beat that person. You're more interested yeah. in designing, you know, your song together. Like I need a drummer. Yeah. You know? Or like the, the competition isn't like how hard you can fall. Right. Like well, yeah, how much for sure. you can take, uh, yeah. <laughs> Sam how, much, how much you could hurt yourself more than other people to make I other remember, people look good. <laughs> yeah. I remember Sam Hargrave wasn't even on that form. There was just one shot. He was fighting on construction site. He fell from second floor onto the dirt for with like, and then there's all these like, just like mythologies just around that one fall. And then like much, much, much later, Vlad, stupid Vlad, I hate him. No, Vlad had a great um, reel that he was building. And there was just one dolly shot. It would just empty alley there was nothing and then it was dolling in and didn't seem very vaude at the time and suddenly out of nowhere sam hargrave again falls from i don't know how high and just like hits his side on the dumpster and i'm like where is the rest of that movie what is this movie and vlad's like it's a project you know he just doesn't say anything and now they're all famous and doing crazy stuff but i just remember yeah like that was how you outdo each yeah. other yeah. and what you're yelling at each other is like but you should wear pads. No, I'm not going to wear pads. Oh, that was so stupid. I we don't know why we... I talked to DL McD, Mc, <laughs> Daniel McDonald, who's a great yeah, stuntman, yeah, stuntman in Toronto. And I remember back in 02, I, I was I texted him on, on AIM, Instant Messenger, <laughs> AOL Instant Messenger. And I said, uh, hey, Dan, um, I, I, I started to put pads on and under my clothes. And he and he felt totally deflated. He was younger than he's younger than me. He felt so deflated because he thought I was doing all my stunts without pads. Oh my and god! He, and so was he. He was. We were all doing these stunts with. We just didn't. Yeah, we didn't think about it, you know. And then of course, and then he was like, "Wait, yo, of course we're gonna use pads." And I mean, so you get over that very quickly, obviously. <laughs> but uh, I mean, there was this like. There was also, you know, what else there was this kind of like. Uh, source of pride in not speeding up your film because we couldn't you can't yeah. speed up you can't speed up 60i footage right yeah, yeah. you couldn't <laughs> speed up 24p it would look terrible it'd be choppy um cut frames every now and then but like we'd call each other on it yeah <laughs> you probably yeah. remember some of these <laughs> no i mean i i actually i'm still confused to your frame cutting you got to do a master class on that we've worked on things we shot like maybe 20 fights together and I've never seen you. I, I, I've never seen the frame. You talk about it. I've never seen it. It's it's not I don't do it often. But if if you if I can notice it, you actually mentioned it one time with Jet Li's Fearless and that you you liked how they did the frame cutting. And and I think that was might, that was yeah. like much more intentional. Like, they, yeah, it's intentional because yeah. they're in slow mo when they frame cut. No, no, it was the broadsword fight. Remember? Oh. And they they just yeah. they're, they're, it's a jump cut. They just do deliberate jump cuts. Yeah, yeah, it was yeah. cool looking. It worked. Um, but when when I would frame cut, I would I would do one frame. Maybe if you know for whatever reason, I could if the punch was this right, mm -hmm. I could probably cut that frame, and then you could or maybe I would cut this one. Otherwise, I thought it was very risky. If there's too much body movement, but I'm very sensitive to that stuff. Mm -hmm. um, I, maybe other people aren't. Yeah, no, I mean, I remember you explaining it. I, I think I remember seeing just the Rope of Dope 2 timeline when we we're cutting it together. And uh, anyway, I I, I would have I would love to see like just you making that choice. But anyways, uh, but uh, forum culture, I think that was that really fostered not just us, but like quite a few filmmaking communities. Uh, one of my best friends, his name is Bing Liu. He was a skater. uh Academy Award nominated for uh, uh, Mining the Gap. And when I was talking about how he talked to him about how he made his movies, they had he had a skate film for him. And it sounded the dynamic sounded like really, really similar to like our forum. And I imagine there's probably like gore creature effect forum and yeah. that kind of thing. I was in this other forum of like, you know, artsy fartsy, like P.D. Anderson fans. Uh, who do we have? We had a guy named Dave Lowry, you know, who directed um, Peter Pan, Wendy movie. What else did he do? The Green Knight and that kind of thing. You know, like a lot of filmmakers like in the 2000s, I think, spent time in forums and we we don't talk about them. Mm -hmm. But I think a lot of times they were probably more useful or 
even more detrimental maybe in certain cases than like film school so yeah i think so i mean Stu mashwitz too i think he had a he had a heavy hand in a forum as well uh yeah i mean that was kind of how you learned stuff back then you know um all right let's move let's move on beyond forums um to actually doing this stuff now when i when i see our our colleagues um going from forum to where they are now do you what's what's that what does that timeline look like to you going from you know vlad manny yourself whoever it might be first showing up on the forum yeah yeah. yeah, andy and then becoming who they are today what do you think that story arc is how would you describe that i mean there are two right one is like the artistic and the other one's a professional one um like you are in Reading with your bros doing your thing. Really interesting crashes, but like not a lot of martial art training. And then when you moved down to San Francisco and you met up with like Vlad and one of the three other Andes uh, and Ray, like your kicking just went up a level and like your fundamentals just, it was just when that, within that, those like six months, like when you, you made a leap with um, what's that one on one on one thing where there's a janitor on the loose escapee escapee. Yeah, that was just like a huge leap. And I, 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 I see that sometimes with uh, uh, these guys, Manny, it was always a little bit trickier because he collaborated with so many people uh but you can definitely just see like his style change it vlad i think was the biggest one vlad was doing what we were doing and suddenly he like developed a sense of humor about himself as like russian samo uh and his choreography like kind of went up one level and i remember he saw like his first guy Ritchie movie i think he saw a snatch and he was just like, the camera speeds up and slow down. I want to do that. And uh, I remember like that was a big uh, 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 conscious. And I, I know he was doing that a little bit. And then he fell in with like those L.A. Ninja people like Jeff and Sean. But really, I think it was like he had this like Korean reawakening. He ate, he made a movie with Alan. Uh, Bet. It's called Bet. Yeah, yeah, yeah. Bet. He showed just like this scene and suddenly it just it just like all the things that he was good at just like came alive for him. And I know professionally, I think he can probably tell you like how he got to where he got ultimately much later. But I remember like there's this <laughs> I think a lot of uh, artistic uh, 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 trajectories for people is is very uh, can be very incremental. But for all of uh, uh, you guys that I saw on the forum usually there was just like one thing where everyone just like whoa um, and uh, yeah and I think Bet was probably like the most pronounced one but in terms of like becoming who they are uh, I always love hearing like Manny talk about it it just seemed like a lot of us had to kind of humbled ourselves and submit ourselves to a system. And when we talk about the system, it's uh, it really is still like a very small community. You're talking about like the action movie industry or whatever. It's still a very small group of people that's constantly like changing hands and changing powers and the market is changing and trying to figure it out. But it seemed like a lot of times that was like just you having like finding the right professional mentor, uh, uh, somebody that could like, not just see your talent, uh, but like put you in places to succeed and that kind of thing. Um, but I don't know, like, uh, uh, because I'm not in the stunt industry that way. So my observations are probably a little more generic. So. Well, sometimes, I, I, sometimes yeah, I think that if we're, if when we're too deep into it though, we, we kind of lose that outside perspective. Um, even the, but even I, I'm not in it the way that those guys are. Right? Like Manny and Flat yeah. are in the weeds, and uh-huh. uh, and I know that myself. Sometimes when I'm so deep in it, I kind of lose track of like what, like where I am from 
point A to point B. I, I just don't even know. Like past five years to me is just one thing, but someone will look at that and say something very different. So you're all as to say is, you know, your 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 incorrect opinions are w- much appreciated. <laughs> yeah, I I do incorrect. think that just because a lot of us came out of, and actually it's not me. So when I say us, I, I mean you guys, uh came out of like very orthodox martial arts background. Um so there's a bit of um like there's a bit of like uh 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 uh, uh that that like hierarchy that is like bred into i think our approach i mean obviously like filmmaking as a system is probably needlessly hierarchical i i I miss the way you and i you know we made movies where everybody can just do anything but uh i also meant that like creatively there are certain things that we just never question um and sometimes i think it's good to like really break it down to its uh fundamentals so to set it up a little bit, one thing that I don't love about current uh, fight choreography, I'm sure, you know, leave in the comments, everybody has a different pet peeve. Uh, my pet peeve is just that uh, it feels very <laughs> insincere. Like they don't feel like none of our performers or their doubles or the choreographers actually feel like these are moves that can hurt people or mm-hmm can e- or even within this world that these moves can hurt people i'm not mm-hmm. talking about like in real life or whatever you know like when you watch donnie or um uh, uh one of his buddies uh, lan yang or whatever every time lan yang is on screen he believes that like that jedi baton is gonna really like kill john boyega whatever like you can just tell there's a conviction um and i think just with the pageant tree the of martial arts in the last 20 years through like wushu and tricking and that kind of thing like there's a cynicism to it where like oh these moves are performed are are to be performed or they're to be graded on their bigness on the uh pristineness of a shape and that kind of thing and we just kind of like lose that like you're talking about uh you know much much decades earlier in hong kong movies why do people look like they're exchange and the longest most elaborate secret handshake with each other but that goes back to a martial idea like a very distinctly chinese idea of like listening and sticking right that is supposed to be an approximation of you kind of like feeling out your opponent and listening to your opponent and looking for opening or trying to learn and trying to adapt the idea of what Bruce Lee said of like being water or whatever. That's what that is supposed to approximate. But over time, it becomes like more and more formal and elaborate. And at some point, I think now, 50 years later, is it's just completely disconnected from uh, its original intention. So just like, we have to do this because this is what people are paying to see. We have to, and they call it shoe leather, they call it whatever, but like, it can be the most interesting things. It's the banter that happens in dialogue before you lead to a punchline or uh, the way that a, pol- a, a detective makes the deductions, which is like the most delicious part and then points out the killer, you know, like uh, the, 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 looking at the empty space and the empty space and oh that's a cat oh that's a killer behind in the mirror behind me like those are the moments that build up to something but they we just don't believe in it at all it's almost uh if if horror movies were to be like that we'll just be like oh what's this over here what's this over here what's this over here death you know like um and if you don't believe that's how fights work, like that's fine, come up with something else. But it feels like we're all just literally going through the motions. Yeah. Um, and that includes, and a lot of times it feels like our friends are being asked to do that. And, <laughs> and there's something like kind of purgatorial about that where we've seen their real, we've seen their work, we've worked with them. We know that they're capable of doing something like much more interesting. But what they're being asked to do is like having I keep saying his name. I don't know why Chris Hemsworth, one of the other Chris's can jump, can can, can be substitute. But they're doing these things. They don't know why they're doing these things. They're actually pretty good at approximating it compared to, let's say, Nick, say from 25 years ago. But 
the like that sense of like intention or belief or anything is mm. gone and we're all just like kind of watching it's like i guess this is the best action movie we have out right now i guess mm. this is why we should keep what we should be supporting we should be grateful that they're doing this and i don't know it's yeah i don't i i just think it's time to try something else or yeah. or to reinvigorate that uh that excitement you're you're basically given a christmas gift and just told to like put the ribbon on top of it right like <laughs> you can't change what's in you can't change the fact that it's another box of seized candy like it's it's yeah. just going to be exactly what they they want and you can do your best to sort of present it in the best way possible i i bring up the berlin team with the uh the new matrix film as an example like these guys are great they're fantastic yeah. within this thing whatever whatever that canvas if you even want to call it that like what can you do you know yeah. no you're not gonna make memorable action with that level of you know that production level so yeah I, yeah i mean yuan wo ping might be the last guy <laughs> to believe that the shaolin long fist could actually hurt people that cha chen or even some of his like Tai Chi applications can hurt people, not just like, isn't it cool that we're doing Tai Chi or whatever. And he might be, I mean, maybe he as a person doesn't believe it, but he as an artist, as somebody with imagination, could imagine his characters like doing damage, like massive amount of internal bleeding damage with, you know, beautiful long uh, 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 operatic moves. And you're just asking a whole group of people to reinterpret that. And it's just, and obviously, I, some of it has to be placed on the choreographer team. I do remember uh, in the early 2000s, Yuan Woping was being asked to, re, to do a bunch of different types of fight choreography that he wasn't interested in. And it's funny that he's now like this face of, this crazy versatility or whatever when for the longest time he was just almost like a one trick dude where you have a movie called tai chi where they're just doing taekwondo and long fist you have a movie called wing chun taekwondo and long fist and um but tarantino was just like i'm paying you a shit ton of money and now you got to do the chambara style and you got to do the sunny chiba style and he sucked it up and he did it. And he did it with conviction. Uh, same thing with like Ang Lee telling him like, none of these moves work. Like, give me something else. And 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 they were just like butting heads on set all the time. But like, you know, uh, Yuan Wuping, a true master, like found something in there that he could connect to and like did it. And... I don't know. He's also obviously d given like much more time and resources than a lot of these like cash grab movies or whatever. But I do believe that at some point, uh, even if you're not the producer or, or or even if you're not like pushing the lever of story and tone, you have to figure out some way to sneak that through the way that yeah. Samuel did or Yang Woping yeah. or. It's funny. Let me back up. You're talking about like being raised in a very formal kind of training system. I had to force that on myself because I knew that every situation I went into where after I had started the stunt people, as soon as I started asking, you know, like, I'd like to take Taekwondo with you. There's immediately like a different exchange involved because like, you know, Andy wanted to make movies. So it was more like a collaboration. Like he'll teach me Taekwondo and I'll make his Taekwondo look like Donnie Yen. Mm -hmm. And, you know, with Dennis, it's like, dude, I want I want to kick like Dennis. And that's when yeah. I was really starting to pick it up. Um, and it's like, but like, I want the the like old school martial art experience. I never got it. I had to kind of force it. So <laughs> this is like a very standard American thing, I think, by and large, with people who want to go out and get something. When you demonstrate that you want something really badly, it's very difficult for you to get like the school of hard knocks results or the school of hard knocks process as a result. Uh, yeah, so yeah, I yeah. Do that, you know? So that so with that in mind, you, you know, so many of us too within, you know, this 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 stunt community, um, you know, we're trying to pull some authenticity from somewhere. Right. We're all trying to do that. Yeah. And uh, sorry, before we, we, we go all the way into that top 
that deep dive. Um, it's also happening in China, right? In Thailand and 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 in a lot of places. Like you ask Samo and whatever, what's happening with China right now? Like they'll give you an answer that sounds uniquely Chinese, but it's uh, but they also complain about a lot of the same things that uh, we are in terms of fight choreography and detail and whatever. And these are people that are born into something that's much more formal or whatever. Not Samo, but, you know, the the younger talents. I mean, you might have just made an interesting point there, which is that like this isn't necessarily an American issue anymore. This might be something that's just happening everywhere. Who in, in the world now emerges from 15 years a very difficult childhood training and just goes <laughs> on to become something incredible and is this incredible, you know, virtuoso at 30. Instead, you have Tom Cruise at 60 doing his own stunts, doing stuff that 30 year old actors aren't doing. I think some of it was just, it's not just um, like the system that breeds these people, right? But it's also like the system that these people built that allows them to be like competitive with one another. Um, like right now, what's happening in uh, the American industries, at least, uh, there is like a Hans Zimmerification of everything. Like Hans Zimmer, obviously known for his like very distinct sound, very iconic score. But what in the in in the composing world, what he's known for is that he's an amazing businessman, and he 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 knows. He, he he knows when to call the producers and, and 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 when producers tell you that the story is not working or whatever and he can offer his service cheaper than everybody else and he just has his army of like assistants and junior composers and people that work under him who do all these things and then he shows up for a couple of days and gives notes and puts like the Hans Zimmer touch on it or for the bigger movies you know he'll do one or two of those where it's him behind everything but it seems that way with uh, uh, stunts and just like everything now. And that's why everything looks the same or whatever is because like you do have people that are talented and, are, and, 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 and distinct and also just like better businessmen than everybody else. And they just know how to come in and how to talk filmmaker than everybody else. They can parrot uh, your needs back to you. And then just proceed to do <laughs> their thing. Yeah. Uh, like that's a skill. Uh, that's a skill that Jackie and Samo and none of those people had to learn. Yuan Woping was the only one that had to learn. Samo tried to learn it and got fired in the in the uh, 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 in, in in the U.S. And then he tried to do it uh, uh, even in China. And Stephen Chow fired him anyway. You know what I mean? Like it's uh yeah you have to actually like listen to the filmmakers needs because their needs have changed but right now it seems like there are a few people who are really good at telling people that they persuade their needs when they're delivering really just like their favorite thing and mm -hmm. the things that they're good at um and it's not good or bad it's just like i just think competent you have like three more Hans Zimmers and suddenly music in like big movies is going to get a lot more interesting again. And I think it's the same thing. I think that's what made like that brief renaissance between 2004 and 2006. So interesting. Like Tony Talk about that. Yeah. yeah. Like action cinema was dead. Like matrix beat it into the ground where like every movie whether it's 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 modern or 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 it's period piece or it's tactical or it's sci-fi or it's PG or it's gruesome or whatever, they're all matrixes. And people just like couldn't think themselves out of that. And and also like weirdly what matrix means to a lot of producers is you get somebody who doesn't know martial arts and you put them on wires and put them in like that's what they think matrix is. Um not like thoughtful, careful choreography uh, and seamless blend of tones. Like maybe, that's not Matrix. Maybe the, maybe the worst, the worst example of that is the Musketeer. <laughs> yeah. And, and uh, it just felt like, do you remember those like music videos for big movies where uh, 
they would do, you know, they'll shoot a movie and then Shirley Manson comes in for one day on the movie set with their band and then they play some music and maybe Will Smith comes in and stands next to her for like a couple of shots between his like lunch breaks or whatever. And that's a music video and you cut that in with the rest of like footage from the movie. That's what the Musketeer did, like felt like. It's like, hi, oh, yeah, yeah, just come in and put all the Chinese guys in like wigs and hats and uh, we'll like pull you around for three days and we'll just cut that <laughs> with like a Disney movie. Um, but yeah, uh, 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 in, so that ran into the ground. Eggs versus Sever? Like, what the hell was that? Um, uh, uh, that was also when like digital like descenders was just everywhere if you want to be a badass then you just hang an actor on a descender um and then tony ja came out out of nowhere and suddenly everyone's like oh no no you didn't and then like donnie yen came out and uh jung du hong came out all within those like and that was so cool that was just like so many different directions and then suddenly even the old heads like Choi Hawk teams up with Han Yan Yan. Like both of them just got kicked out of Hollywood and they're like, let's make seven swords. Let's do something completely crazy. Uh, shoot it with like Lo Garland that was like recovering from chemo. But like that was, yeah, I don't know when that would happen again. And in Korea, it wasn't just like Joan Du Hong. It's that the bald guy that did the hallway fight and old boy. I forgot his name. Yeah, Truman. Oh no, um, the bald guy? The, the choreographer. I don't know. It doesn't matter. So, I should know. I mean, that. it doesn't matter. Know. Sorry, I don't know your name. Leave it in the comments. Yeah. But that was, yeah, that was amazing. And then, uh, I don't know. Born what do you think? Came. Was there something? Well, Born was 2002. Um, but it felt like that style didn't pick up until Casino Royale. And, and, and really, shirt. yeah. And really, when you look at the 2002 Born, it's not. It's not shake. They get steady cam coverage style. It was the editing, not the yeah. camera. Yeah. Um, no, it was really like supremacy, and that's when it w- went into what it was. Yeah. Uh, but um, what do you think it was in that that time period, oh four to 06? Because I agree, these are some of the greatest action films ever made. Flashpoint um, was in there. Um, was there? was it was it simply people saying hey i mean i guess tony Jaw really was like instrumental in kicking that off but what kicks yeah. off something like that i mean tony Jaw was almost like a meteor meteoric event like we were hit with tony Jaw, but also tony Jaw demonstrated like how rare it is to be jackie chen like you can do jackie chen for three movies and your body just breaks down like Jackie is, again, comparing him to like LeBron, who I don't even like as an athlete, but like some some athletes, their bodies just uh, don't break down. Or when they break down, they break down in a way that allows them to have, like their tendons are intact, their knees are intact. And what they break are their bones or bruises and whatever. Like, um, and yeah, like Tony Jaw was just like this singular event where he paired off with uh, what seems to be like a pretty generic kind of collaboration a music video director a commercial director that was what they were doing in the 2000s every commercial director gets an action movie uh but yeah it was just this guy that really figured out how to showcase like all of his abilities and <laughs> it wasn't just him, by the way. It was his, it was his mentor, Panna, who had who had been doing movies like that for about 15 years, by the way. And they, right, just, never, right. they just never became, you know, commercially viable overseas. But I think there's something about Tony Ja as a performer, but also just that style where you felt like you were seeing some moves or they definitely like you hadn't seen them before. But a lot of times it just felt like you're seeing I don't know, even like a sprint for the first time or a windmill for the first time. Like, and in your interview with Scott, uh, uh, I love what Scott said about you is uh, you have the ability to bring up your arm at the very, very last frame uh, um, 
of like of of I guess what is allowed before you get hit in the face. And Tony Jaa ha- has almost the opposite ability where he's doing something in slow motion, but still that kick yeah. hits like two frames sooner. So you always like you you always feel that impact or whatever. Um, yeah, so I think I, yeah, just. His 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 physical abilities are. I watch him. I I I know what you're talking about with like he's kind of moving in slow mo, and that's it's kind of true in the sense that he has a way of moving that is so big for a small guy. Mm-hmm. Where, and I've actually there's a part of me that's this is going to sound very strange, Pete. Look, when I do this, when I block at the last second, sometimes I do that because I don't really know what to do in the meantime. <laughs> I don't know what to do with myself. Um, especially when I've memorized when you've memorized the choreography and when you think this certain way, like you don't you you don't know how to go kind of like up like this. And Roger Yoon was the one that told me on Blindsided, like you smoother is faster because I was doing that too much and it was kind of like making things a little bit jerky at times. Um, and so it kind of can inhibit how that coordination works between you and the other person. Uh, but when I watch Tony and and other you know other great action stars, um, some in the West too, where they're able to kind of just like act through the move through the block, yeah, and that can that's like that's an important skill because it it means that you're actually meshing well with the other person, and uh, it it has a kind of fullness and <laughs> it's not like I'm critiquing coffee it has this like richness to it that, <laughs> that I, like, I I mean. No, when you look I, at him, you get very fulfilled watching this guy. He doesn't look I know what you're saying. You know what I mean? Yeah. I know what you're saying. And I think some choreography are built to like flow into one another. But I don't think I don't but not your choreography, because you're not doing a lot of like shapes in the traditional sense. It's because I done. make it. And so anytime somebody else is doing it and I come in, that's the problem. So But, but uh, I guess so, but I think you can say that with almost any stunt performer that there are better choreographers for, for their strengths. Sure. They're just better Uh, at actually performing for other people. (laughs) Anyway, but that's about me. We're talking about Tony John. Okay. But whatever you think you are doing or not doing with your jerky style, like I have to say, like nobody directs stunt guys better than you when you're in the middle of, of it, you set the tone and, you don't have to tell them to hit how hard or how precise or act in any whatever way you put them in the place and the way you react feels realistic enough that they do follow you. Okay. But in terms of Tony, uh, actually it's opposite, like where the stunt team have to very carefully like wait and stick their heads out and that kind of thing. And that's also why maybe that kind of style works for a, couple of movies and then eventually just yeah i think one his knees just just gave out because he was also older um and two yeah just not a lot of it's it it, it, uh, it's not very he's doing the most believable version of that choreography but that choreography has its limits um, and if we, also, if we're to talk about that, too, I also feel like um, one thing, another thing that I don't love about modern choreography that I do feel like kind of started with Tony Ja is that there's like uh, this culture of like NPC-ness, like stunt guys exist to be NPCs for the hero and they have to do everything to complement like what the hero is doing. Um and that's just like very different from how, let's say, Donnie choreographs or how like Jackie or whatever. I compare that to having NPCs set you up is almost like in the 90s when you get like uh, good looking people to, to be in sitcoms like Friends or whatever. And you just bring these like amazing comedians, you know, Pat Oswalt and David Cross. They come in, but they play the straight guy. They just say ridiculous lines. So Ross to be like did you just say bro? And then everyone laughs or, you know, that kind of thing. Um, and it's the same thing, but with, with fight choreography, it's just like people sticking their faces and their hands and their whatever out just so the star can make those shapes and do their favorite thing. 
And if you're a Tony Judd, that's one thing, but a lot of people aren't Tony yeah. Judd. Do you think though, like when I when I look at Chambara action and I know like the Toei action school would spend uh Ruben talks about this in his episode, they, they would spend a year training the uh the peripheral stunt guys. They spend a year on footwork. And what I love about Chambara films is that when you look at like especially a Toei one and Japan Action Club, you look at any any dude in the background, they're all character actors, you know, like they have it down. They've nailed it. And you're never disappointed by that. And you, and if you, if you buy the theory, which I do, that Bruce Lee had borrowed heavily from Chambara action when designing a lot of the action for Fist of Fury, you look at the peripheral guys in Fist of Fury and they're not up to snuff. <laughs> more yeah. cut, more cutting is needed. Um, they they kind of phone it in because they're not used to shooting like that, right? It's very mm-hmm. it's very different shooting style than what they're used to. Um, so, and you know, if you want to carry that forward to John Wick. You are you are basically saying like, okay, we're gonna shoot wide, super wide on John Wick. We're gonna shoot so wide so we can see this the art design, which is one of my favorite parts of that whole series, just like the, the yeah the set design. Um. We're doing this so that we maintain frame with the lead actor. We're also doing it so that the stunt guys, when they fall, we don't have to tilt down and show them. So we're kind of combining this American and uh, Chinese style of like seeing stuntman, right? How do you, like, how, how do you even, I've been that guy in the background waiting. That's a hard job, man. Like, I, I don't think- know what it is, but it's tough to be that guy. Yeah, I think that was my favorite part about Rope of Dope 2 was, you know, when we went through that final scene in the arcade. And you can tell that a lot of our friends actually like want to be want to be more accommodating and they want to be more NPCs. They want to be as menacing as whatever as possible. And I enjoy like, for example, going to Alan and going to like just giving them little characters like you just had a day like this. You're just like you got to treat them like characters. Um, Stu Mashowitz had a great story about his first day shooting with Cher and everything was going wrong. And and they're really, really late. And Stu, six foot four, you know, tall, lanky white guy. And he grabbed a little megaphone and he goes, OK, when I'm done. You know, uh, 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 principals come this way, extras come this way. He hops off the thing, uh, the ladder, and he didn't realize that Cher was standing right behind him. This teeny tiny woman who like snuggles up to him, whisks him away in this like big fur coat. And she's like, says in her very like husky voice, she's like, honey, when you call people extras, they're going to act like extras. But if you call them talent, they will give you talent. And since then, since that story, I've never treated people like, extras um and uh i don't know i think that's how i got into sundance i had a short where there was a whole room of extras but i I was just like all these people showed up for me for this story like i gotta give them something to do so i try to figure out things that is fun for them to do and create an atmosphere that felt real and you can i think you can tell and it's the same thing with like that old boy fight those are some of the we're stunt guys but they look like characters they look like you can like figure out their lives you know that big like big guy that like swung one punch fell and just talk shit the rest of the time like he lives with his mom right he has to live with his mom um and i think that's the thing with john wick that is uh, uh um yeah that like i would love to see is like okay you create this world of all these people are colorful assassins. They're all John Wick in their own life story. But as soon as the action begins, they're all just NPCs. Uh, and I just think like that's a really, really fun opportunity if, if you're doing John Wick. I mean, they're starting to do it with John Wick for with some of the main main villains are less NPC, NPC but I think you can extend that to, to everybody. And or... You do the other way where like you talk about like Chambara or whatever, like if you want an army of NPCs, then they have to move as one. They have to be just like this lethal, all encompassing, like nasty thing. But in John Wick, it seems like uh, there are just people who are the deadliest killers in the world. But yeah, and run in there, just there. Yeah. And I think. 
you know, I mean, this is, of course, the value of being able to sh- hold frame on Keanu is that people don't look at that. They, they're they yeah. not looking at that. You could probably reshoot John Wick by just shooting the background actors and you'd have a different movie. Um, but that is the benefit of shooting that way. Uh, and therefore, that's why the action style is the way that it is so that you can shoot like that. If you're doing Jackie choreography, you can't shoot like that. I actually, yeah. And I actually don't have a, I, I said John Wick because this is one that everyone sings. I actually don't have a problem with John Wick since that feels like the world that they're setting up. So John Wick, ironically or paradoxically, is <laughs> when I'm talking about John Wick, I'm talking about other movies I want yeah. to be John Wick. There's a John Wickification that is going on with, um, yeah, with just cinema in general. Yeah, and I, I mean, I think that if you, you know, when you're approaching action from from the perspective of, you know, like what what do we, how do we, how do we dance, how do we dance these performers around our actor, right? Yeah, and when you when you treat it like, uh, when you treat it like a Hong Kong fight where everything is sort of like, you know, choreographed appropriately and it's all timing based, then you kind of have this. You have, in my opinion, a cultural break. <laughs> and like American style action just doesn't really work that way. Uh, you have to shoot it like a Hong Kong fight if you're going to do that. Um, whereas when you when you have a very kind of intent based approach, where the act where the background actors, you it's it's kind of like okay, you here's your intention as an actor, right? Is that you never give up? That's like like there are rules for background characters in John Wick. There are these rules. If you watch them, there are these like very specific rules about like you, you never, you're never dying. You're either up or you're uh-huh. down or you're trying to get up. Yeah. Right. And if you're trying to get up, he, like you're going to get knocked back down. So there are these like rules that, that, that the, that the movie follows. Um, and so, yeah, yeah, I think that maybe like that, that would be the approach is that you set up these rules for your NPCs in the background. Cause you are going to be, you are going to be that within anything outside of John Wick, where you have full control over camera and edit. Uh, the studio instead is going to have full control. So you just have to kind of look the best that you can in the background. So as the action director, you should just set your rules accordingly for your background. Yeah, actors. but I, I do think that, I mean, those rules are, you would know this better than me. Those rules are like game design rules. You know what I mean? And, and I think, John Wick like is a video game and they pay like uh, obvious tributes to video games. I have no problem with that, but anything outside of that. And yeah, like it is something that is not uh, uh, that doesn't like really exist in the West until Matrix. And then now, but now that's the only type of fight scene that we get. We don't get a good one on one fight scene. I don't I can't remember when the last time we got a good one. Um, Even in John Wick ends with like pistol duel uh you know they they get all the action out of the way and they have a dramatic scene um so uh, yeah i don't isn't that funny even like but it even seems that jackie's movies as he got high, bigger and bigger budgets you have yeah. fewer of these one-on-one fights i think they just take forever right donnie is like the last one that's doing these iconic one-on-ones but yeah I, it's uh and yes like the way donnie fights and like npc like in uh in the japanese dojo or whatever like they are moving as like and 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 that was built into the story like why they are being robotic and stiff and that kind of thing um it's like because that was just our understanding of how dojo was back then or whatever um but yeah, like, uh, but that that's also why these fights are supposed to be impressive. Like, they're not just impressive because you can't afford a lot of stunt guys. You can't afford to pay, you know, SAG minimum for stunt guys. Uh, 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 they're, they should be impressive because it's really, really hard to coordinate and get right. And so what is the point of doing this thing and then make it as easy as possible? We tried. Uh, we tried to do this in Death Grip. Remember? I mean, we've got 15 people in that in that <laughs> in that fight, and um, but those people had stories. Like I went around telling them stories. It was like you are a uh, yeah, you're like an engineer, and you got recruited uh, uh, yeah. to this call and that kind of thing. We almost shot a scene where they talked about that, and that wasn't needed. 
but like you, there is a sense of like who these people are supposed to be who these people think they are like the cloak is an armor in no way but there is like a person and the point of that scene is like you finally being able to like see through the cloak to just see like the the people but also that that also had a comment on mob behavior it's like the if if these things are supposed to be like dramatic right characters are supposed to change they're supposed to like adapt or whatever and you had like 15 people and they're collective mentality changed from like who is this guy let's take this guy to oh shit and like you're gonna you know like their sense of themselves they abandoned the cult at the end of it you know and like <laughs> you deprogrammed them uh with a baton so you know like that's what's supposed to happen and you just don't really get that anymore you don't treat them like characters with like yeah, wants and needs and whatever, but that's supposed to be like what's exciting about these yeah. fights. The, the uh, other thing too, just to jump into the the NPC ness is um is just the movement quality. Um, it's very difficult on these big shoots to quality control all of the the background stunt guys. Where it's it's actually much easier if they can all sort of just come in with this sort of commodified move set. Um, and everything will kind of look the same way. Everyone will do the same footwork. It's very predictable that way. And so your performers could be doing exactly what they're supposed to do. They could do the you know performance of a lifetime. But the fact that they have to all move the same way in order to coordinate that, how then do you have a character, <laughs> right? Yeah, You're gonna, I don't that's think... going to be detracting from that a little bit. Yeah, so I don't think they have to. And also let's uh, uh delve into something that i threw out a, a while ago too right like this idea of belief like does any do any of these performers actually think that uh, they have that this could this would happen in real life or that if they were in this situation these are the things that they would do uh and you watch i think one of the greatest group fights is bitter bittersweet life like it's very very logical how he went from a battery to a brick to a thing to a car to whatever like just the way he takes out he's he is able to take out layers up on layers of 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 bad guys you can tell like it's not it doesn't stretch the imagination that much like you can tell that they probably buy it i bought it um and uh and you just don't it's just a lot more rare in terms of like haven't any semblance of like conviction from from the top down like and i think if the producer you know the the writer doesn't believe in and the director don't believe in the stars don't and the stunt you know it's all down and it, it feels very cynical so they're there to do their best but there's like nothing to like to do their best at what you know um tell a story or be an NPC. I'll say I'll I'll just say this that like it's <laughs> sometimes sometimes it's safer for you to not stick out not be a character um even though as a stuntman in America you you are sort of expected to be an actor but um that then you risk missing your mark right like the more you sort of throw chaos in between your moves then like the more likely you are to miss your mark there's a disincentive against doing that um and so you're you're kind of better off not doing that and that system doesn't really give much feedback to performers right like nobody's going to come up to the stuntman number six and go like hey dude i really liked what you did when you were just talking talking <laughs> smack to the to the lead it was really cool this is just that feedback almost doesn't exist um no feedback is good feedback in a sense but yeah then, and also it, it's weird like the system is not built for that so as a director like one of the first things that i learned when i start working with union talent is i'm not supposed to talk to there are certain people that just can't talk to you can't direct the quote-unquote like the background people because then there will be principles and they have to be paid as such or whatever so a lot of times they're handled by ad's or uh you know people people that direct crowds specifically and also in action scenes like they're not even a lot of times they're not handled by like the main coordinator right like one of the 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 uh, uh, other guys on on the day so um yeah i also think like 
that system of hierarchy kind of hurts it um in that like these people just even if you want to direct them it's expensive to direct them like you can't actually direct them that much um there's that movie roma uh 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 by uh you know who i'm talking about the guy that did gravity uh alfonso Cuar Cuaron. and a reason roma i felt like was so good was because he was in mexico and he could just direct every single person that must have been so fun for director to you know work 20 years in the studio system to finally be able to do that um and i also think that's yeah son of is the case is like their hands are if you ask them to do like a couple extra things and suddenly it's so much more expensive um but yeah i do think son of it is just the casting like let's get people that don't look like stunt guys too <laughs> or yeah it's 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 it's, it's crazy because even our actors our stars are built like stunt guys now and like the charm of a bruce willis was that he was he was shaped like not maybe not a dad but like a divorced dad who got a little bench set in his garage or something like that trying to hold on to his hair and that's why you like him um yeah i don't know like there should almost be a school of like how to fight bad, and that was Jackie's like specialty. Is like he wanted his guys to like be sloppy and fight badly. Oh but yeah, there's that. There's that one guy. He's in. He's he's all over his '80s films. I don't know who this guy is. He's got the worst kicks. He's got the worst punches. He punches <laughs> like this. Punches like this. <laughs> and man, this guy's so awesome because he just looks like a he just looks like a bad guy in a suit who's trying to get a briefcase from point A to point B. He don't yeah. look like a guy I went to a dojo. He's like, yeah, it, it just punches <laughs> like that. And it <laughs> so like to, to be able to fight bad. I think bad fighting, by the way, is like such an amazing skill when people can do this. Because like, how do you untrain martial arts? You kind of can't. This is a game that we play all the time as martial artists yeah. to pretend to like to figure out who can kick like a white belt again and it's gone. <laughs> like that's like yeah. that's like bringing back the Big Bang. Like it's like bringing back <laughs> it's gone. <laughs> and <Yeah. laughs> and so like the ability then to act unchoreographed and act uncoordinated, I think like requires like a, this kind of like you know, super enlightened kind of martial art training. I think it's almost easier if you give them a character. If it's true, you know, you and tell somebody, yeah, if you tell somebody, oh, you're raised in a traditional dojo where the guys never taught you how to fall, like then you at least get the stunt guys like chances to try things like where he doesn't know how to break his fall uh, as he lands on the ground and that kind of thing. Um, I mentioned this earlier. I, I really do think like Barry, even though it's not an action show at all, it's kind of uh it 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 offers a lot of like potential solutions for action. Uh there is a scene there there there's because they do play with the idea of like these expectations. Bill Hader did put himself through the same, you know, John Wick school or whatever. Like he can't you know uh, uh shoot on flinch and 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 you know uh, pie a room and 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 clear and that kind of thing and and reload but he he's never in those kind of situations like he would sneak into a bad guy's lair and it'd be really really tense and then the you know try to raid a drug house or whatever these gorilla soldiers and then he would see that the gorilla soldiers were just like microwaving food and then they have their guns and then he shoots them and like that weirdly felt a lot more satisfying than if they had a thing and or uh there was a scene where like a bunch of uh, ex-military guys were planning and they got their training so they got this like perfect plan to uh you know again do another raid or whatever and then the last second the guy decides that he's going to change his plan like without telling anybody and just like guns straight like guns blazing and they get shot down or whatever but i don't know you hear that a lot like in, in terms of like in drug wars uh, uh uh or 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 like street gun fights or whatever where you have a plan but somehow in the last second for whatever reason they just change it up and we don't ever see that like reflected in 
fight choreography. And I, I also think some of it is that um, I think, you know, since Michael Mann or whatever, there's just this over-reliance on tactical advisors who some of them are amazing and give you like insane stories about what it was like in Mogadishu doing Black Hawk Down. But some of them are like, um, if with the proper training, if you can reload fast enough, two of you can really shoot through this whole warehouse full of people and that kind of thing. And people just kind of like buy into that the same way that would, that would be like back in the days when choreographers just listen are just like Aikido instructors and every move was just you grab somebody's wrist and then they turn you over. I, I, I just think, uh, yeah, I don't know. We got to approach it in the, in the, in a different way. I also been thinking about this a bit. Uh, have you seen green room or blue ruin? Yes. The thing I love about those movies is they don't use violence or action to solve problems. They use those to create problems. A guy thinks he's in a revenge movie, tries to kill a guy, and a whole movie happens after that. That's supposed to be the end of a movie. And we, I feel like even though Jackie's movies are very classical, he was creating problems for himself in the middle of a fight scene by trying this thing. And then he gets himself, he's going to jump from second floor to the first, first floor to uh, make way for Logarleon and drunken master too. And he crashes through the table and now he's stuck in there. Like having characters make decisions that makes their lives like harder, I think is super, super underrated. Um, and we just don't do that anymore. <laughs> and you think that that's because we are incentivized to like, I mean, what, why not? What's wrong with, <laughs> what's wrong with that? I don't know. <laughs> why can't we have a, a moment? If you where... ask Manny, he'll say politics. <laughs> <laughs> yeah. Um, yeah, I think. I don't, yeah, I don't know. Uh, I do think some of it is just because they're not, uh, they're not required to, right? Like everybody seems perfectly happy with uh, the NPC and the Marvel, you know, like with just characters and actors in a room doing a thing that they rehearsed for six weeks and uh, without any proper set with just like an empty yeah. space. Sweet. Do you think that maybe the, you know, these bigger budget films, the only way that you can really introduce chaos into the into the formula, like the only way that you can have that chaos is if it's in the script. And that's not in the choreo. That's like a jet going out. And like that then is a transition point from this fight into this. fight. It's not like how that fight choreography then shifts within that problem uh instead it's like well let's just use that to carry to a new scene and then we build an action scene for that and then now we have a new crisis okay so it goes to this scene we build an action scene around that yeah but i don't know like again like without reading the script right um but i'm you look at the bathroom fight in mission impossible six um that is one where uh they're creating problems for themselves where like tom cruise and henry cavill both think they're <laughs> They're like much, much better than 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 they were, and just being surprised the hell by like Liang Yang, um, in 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 those moments. And I I do think like those are the couple of uh, uh action scenes that I could think of where like characters keep getting themselves into worse and worse predicament, and then somebody has to like how do you beat Liang Yang? Is like oh somebody shoots him in the face. Like that's the only way you could beat him. Um, and I love that for that. And it seemed like a lot of what was fun and memorable about, about the fight were those little nuances, were the cutaways to Tom Cruise doing his Eric Jacobas going like, I that was supposed to work. I'm fucking Tom Cruise. And then it just, it just did not. And Henry Cavill as well. Like they play with almost with who the actors are just like, this is Superman. And it's like, oh, actually Superman stinks in a in a real fight like this doesn't work um yeah that's it's a wonder like subversion is a wonderful wonderful thing and i don't know i think we're kind of well that fight era, that, that fight took i think four weeks to shoot they planned a couple days and it did, they did four weeks and that might have been the fruit of that right yeah uh yeah i think that's 
exactly right obviously when you give them more time you're allowed to actually like do takes in a different way and think about things and like follow some instincts and some gut feelings and things like that um but i also think a lot of times like when i talk to my director friends they want that but when they they don't know how to ask or like direct out of it or as soon the the art of like fighting has gotten so precise and tech technical now that a director couldn't feel comfortable like stepping in and saying that doesn't feel right that doesn't you know you just get shut down by somebody else telling you well the other way is too dangerous uh or we just don't have enough time and that kind of thing uh and it's not just with stunt coordinators uh sometimes you want to change a shot and they say uh lighting will take relighting will take an hour and then you're stuck with an ugly shot you know like um uh, yeah i don't know sometimes compartmentalization like it was what made hong kong cinema so great but it seems like now it's uh biting us in the ass a little bit how do you get around this issue when you're making films and you want to introduce problems what is your approach i think i hire eric jacobus <laughs> that is what I mean, like, yeah, hiring people that will, like, notice those, like, who are storytellers as well, who get what you're trying to do. I think that is really, I, I don't know. I think so much of directing is just, like, in <laughs> hiring, like, in casting your behind-the-scenes people. But, yeah, I, I do think, like, you have to write it into the movie you almost have to override it and maybe over explain it and just not worry that oh that'll be too you can always cut down the fight it's much harder to like add a story inside of a fight um um boots riley uh you know just directed this like really super goofy fight scene that took you know two days to shoot between walton goggins and uh cc ice uh the the the, the stunt women uh, who's in a ninja cost costume and Walton Goggins was he's fighting like com almost completely new except wearing like a koala like uh, a boxer brief or whatever and that guy first of all I think Walton has like I I, I, I think they're untrained actors who just haven't found the style yet I think if I gave Walton Goggins like the sunny Chiba super stiff like exaggerated almost like ugly action like he could nail it but, you know, Boots wrote this thing that just has like three or four uh, gags in there. And the fight just even if uh, they didn't have all the time to, you know, put put a bowl on like all the shoe leather or whatever stuff like it was just interesting, which is like fun. And he's written stuff in there that like you couldn't wushu fight it or whatever. Sometimes you want your superhero to have a pose and then they just do a wushu version of that pose. There, there are like certain things you write in there and there's already a vocabulary built around it. Um, in this fight, Walton picks uh, the ninja who falls on the rug and then he does a pencil roll where he just like walks as if on, 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 on water over the rug and then it rolls her. Like, you can't make that, yeah, you can't turn that into, like, a ballet. And sometimes I, I, I do think, like, that's just what has to happen, is the writer has to just be like, I haven't seen this before, and I would dare anyone to turn this into, like, a finishing pose with this. Yeah. That's great. Well, unfortunately, yep. we, we didn't disagree as much as I had hoped. Um, I we'll, try, we'll try again another time that we can do more of these. <laughs> Um, yeah yeah any uh any parting words of um advice wisdom i've always appreciated how you see action because it's not the way that i see it um yeah if you are a stunt stunt guy like try to try to be in competition with each other like really try to outdo each other and make yourself stand out uh and if you are a director like this is a terrible advice but like second guess your stunt guy a little more I mean, you don't have to be an ass about it but like 
you should like uh, wonder the same way like Troy Hark and those people have wondered like do does everyone have to move this way or whatever and maybe it's up to you to give all the characters like a different story and also don't write an end fight where it's just one character and a ton of NPCs you know like that would help as well so but yeah uh also play less video games I think I think it was cool when we were all inspired by video games and whatever. But I think video games is its own art, has its own system. Video games sucks when it tries to imitate film. And I think right now movies suck when we try to imitate video games. So, yeah. Fantastic. Unless it's, uh, unless it's an old man cradle game. Yeah, imitate that. <laughs> but yeah, okay, cool. Yeah, I... Uh, uh... I appreciate all that. And, you know, speaking from my experience working with you, um, yeah, that that works really well when directors, you know, you say second guess, um, you put up a fight and, you know, I think maybe sometimes directors don't really realize how willing stunt performers and stunt men and stunt women are willing to have that fight and hash it out and find the truth. So, um, yeah, I think Ang Lee, I don't know. I wish people would translate that book already. Ang Lee talked about like how miserable it was to shoot with Yuan Wuping on Crouching Tiger. Everything was a fight, but uh, it's just the movie is what it is, you know? So, yeah. Yeah. Thanks, Pete. Right. Thank you, Eric. Go make something cool. Oh, well. uh, subscribe and like and subscribe. Is that what people <laughs> say? I don't know. I, is that what they do now? like and subscribe bye action talks is available on youtube itunes and spotify join my telegram at t.me slash eric jacobus you can check out my studio at superalloyinteractive.com my website and blog is at ericjacobus.com and be sure to subscribe thank you